All right. Uh, thank you all for coming today to our talk about OVN, or Open Virtual Network. My name is Russell Bryant. Uh, I'm Justin Pettit. And I'm Ben Pfaff. And I'm a little sleepy this afternoon, so if I fall asleep, I've made these guys promise to wake me up for my part. <laughs> yeah. Um, and all of us are, are core developers and maintainers of the OVN project. We're going to talk about, uh, more about the project today. And to first start, I just want to start with some, some principles about OVN. So OVN has been, been under development for about a year and a half now. And these are some really just core driving principles that we've used as we've built the project, things that we think about a lot, that we talk about a lot, and hopefully we'll come through in the rest of the presentation and we'll refer back to these things. For example, performance is a key one. Um, I am relatively new to OVS compared to these guys. I learned, I've learned a lot about OVS as, uh, as a part of contributing to OVN, but the other two guys here helped create OVS, and they've learned a lot over the years on the best ways to use OVS, the best ways to get, uh, to get the uh, best performance out of it. Um, great ideas on new features to add to OVS to be able to implement features natively in OVS that haven't been able, uh, that hasn't been possible before. So we've um, uh, done some really great things in that area. Scalability has been key. This is an important area for OpenStack, targeting you know, not just hundreds of hypervisors, but thousands. This also is incredibly key for other areas that OVN is applicable to, particularly in the container space, where the density of containers on a given node is much higher. The rate of change in terms of containers coming and going is much higher. So we've had scale at the top of our mind and, and, and scale testing at the at top of mind. Simplicity, hopefully that comes through in the design. We feel we, we have a, a pretty simple design that's a good uh, base to build on, continue building on for the future. Reliability, one key difference of OVN is, is the way that not just the, uh, the data path, but also the control plane is drastically different than the way Neutron has worked historically. And, and a lot of that is based on um, for reliability reasons and also visibility. So as, as, uh, as networking becomes more complicated, it's also critically important that we give you tools to understand what's happening in the network and not just understand what's happening in the network on a given host and understand how packets processed, but understand how packets are processed on a network level. So tracing packets as they, they would uh, traverse all of OVN across multiple hypervisors and we'll talk more about that later. So, what is OVN? It's virtual networking uh, for Open vSwitch. It's a part of the Open vSwitch project. Um, so uh, it's, it's developed in all the, the same places in the same uh, uh, you know, repository as OVS itself. So OVS moved to the Linux Foundation fairly recently. I think that was a very positive move for the project. And they've uh, already become quite helpful in, uh, in managing different aspects of how the, the project runs. I mentioned a, a, few, a couple minutes ago that OVN has been going about a year and a half now. We finally reached our, our first release, what we you know, consider our first non-experimental release, and that's part of OVS 2.6. I'd, I'd kind of call that uh, OVN's 1.0, although OVN is just really just a part of OVS, so it's part of OVS 2.6. And corresponding to that, we just also did our first release of the Neutron plugin uh, called Networking OVN in, in OpenStack. And that was a part of the OpenStack and Newton release. So the major milestone we've reached here is that we've now uh, built it out enough that we think it's ready for people to start using and, and trying out and giving more, uh, more feedback. All right, I wanted to uh, just go over some of the features. It contains uh, most of what you'd expect from a networking virtualization project. So uh, it manages the overlays and the connectivity between the different hypervisors and physical nodes that need to be managed. Uh, it supports uh, ACLs, L2 through L4 um, policies uh, can be written, uh, stateful policies as well. Um, the, uh, we support distributed L3 routing for both IPv4 and IPv6, and uh, I'll get into that a little bit in the next slide. Uh, we have native support for NAT, load balancing, and DHCP, and it works on the systems where Open vSwitch works. So it works on Linux, uh, DPDK, and Hyper-V. Um, and it has support for both L2 and L3 gateways, uh, and we um, support hardware gateways as well, some top of racks to do L2 connectivity so that physical workloads can be brought into an OVN logical network. Uh, the OVN itself doesn't have a management plane. It's expected to be controlled by something like Neutron, um, so we've, we've provided the integration for OpenStack. Uh, we've also been working on integration with, uh, with container platforms as well, so um, Kubernetes, Docker, and Mesos, uh, and also some, uh, there's some work being done to uh, support Overt. So for IPv4 and IPv6 routing, the, um, we have native support for that, uh, meaning that we don't have to use the, the Linux uh, kernel to, to do the routing for us. We do that internally, and it's, uh, it's distributed. The, um, 
And so um, all of the uh, L3 calculations happen on the hypervisors themselves. Uh, and by doing that, we can actually do ARP and neighbor discovery suppression. So rather than when someone wants to know what the, the MAC binding is for a particular address, it doesn't have to send a broadcast message, and those broadcast messages sent everywhere. Um, that, that local process that's running, uh, called oven controller that uh, Russell will get into, will um, takes care of that. So rather than, than forwarding the, the ARP request or the neighbor discovery message, it will just respond locally uh, because it distributes the state of the, the, of the bindings uh, throughout the, the different oven nodes. And then uh, we do some, some interesting things with, uh, with flow caching. So that rather than like the way that the uh, things are usually done on, on OpenStack, where there are different network namespaces that are used to do routing. So if you had multiple router hops, you would send the packet to, to one network namespace and then to another network namespace. That incurs quite a bit of overhead because you're having to do those different hops between those namespaces. And they have to go through uh, multiple lookups from the bridges or, or OVS instances between them. And what we do is, uh, when, we, when we have to do a, a forwarding decision on the hypervisor, we figure out what the, what the ultimate destination is. So we know it has to go through multiple logical routers, and the destination MAC address is going to be something. So rather than send it actually th along each of those steps, we calculate what the end result is. So if you went through two logical routers, we would just decrement the TTL by two, and then set the MAC address, and then just immediately send it to the node. Uh, and so then it means that the L2 performance, or sorry, the L3 performance is as fast as L2 performance because it's just a single lookup uh, modification and a forward. Uh, and one of the goals that we've had with OVN is to make it so that uh, we don't have to run a CMS specific agent. And so with uh, the only thing that we want to run is uh, oven controller. We haven't completely gotten there yet, but, but uh, L3 doesn't require the, uh, the local uh, OpenStack agent. It just runs uh, in oven controller itself. All right, let's talk about DHCP. So uh, DHCP uh, makes me think back to some of the principles that uh, Russell was uh, talking about a, a minute ago. And the one that uh, it, it really calls out for me is uh, simplicity. So DHCP is conceptually very simple. A VM sends out a packet. Uh, that says, what's my IP address? And then a DHCP server uh, sends back a response saying, here's your IP address and a, a few other bits of information. Now, uh, the, the problem is that uh, most uh, OpenStack deployments need more than that. Uh, you have to either run a, a per uh, hypervisor DHCP agent or you have to run uh, something centrally in your network and, and, and make it uh, uh, perhaps uh, per uh, logical switch and, and so on. It's kind of a pain uh, from, from everything I've heard. Uh, but with OVN, we've ma managed to make it actually simple. Uh, OVN has DHCP support in OVN controller, uh, the, the, the local OVN agent, and it, it runs in the, um, in, in the same uh, logical flow table that everything else is implemented in. Uh, so basically, uh, a packet comes from the VM, it gets matched in the flow table, uh, that uh, fills in all the DHCP stuff and sends it right back to the VM. Uh, no fuss, no muss. The DHCP packets, uh, they never leave the hypervisor. Uh, it, our design is flexible enough that you can supply uh, arbitrary DHCP options on a per logical switch or per VM basis. Um, although uh, OpenStack doesn't have a need for it, we also have uh, support for uh, a simple form of, uh, of basic IP address management, IPAM, uh, where OVN can assign the IP addresses. Um, so the design is meant for a simple case. If you have really sophisticated DHCP requirements, then you'll have to use something external, but we expect this to cover the uh, majority of deployments, and, and maybe if there are some uh, uh, common cases we've missed, then maybe we can add them later. Um, one of the things we know we've missed is DNS. Uh, we're working on uh, having a built-in DNS server uh, in the next version of OVN. There's already uh, some, some work on that. Um, and then uh, later on, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, debugging features that we've added in this uh, release, of uh, this first release of OVN. And I I'm going to show in particular how you can use that to see what's going on with DHCP. All right. So we've talked about some of the uh, key features of, of OVN. Now I want to take sort of a graphical look of how does OVN work? How does it fit into the context of Neutron? What are the key elements? We've referred to like uh, OVN controller a bit, so I'll show you where that comes into play. 
So the first step of how OVN works with Neutron is you have Neutron and we have an ML2 driver. It's called Networking OVN. And uh, so that's, that's the Neutron API server. When you create networks or ports, Neutron resources in that API server, what our driver does conceptually is then create those uh, resources in OVN's northbound database. That's a, it's conceptually quite simple. It just creates things in OVN's database. OVN's northbound database is effectively like OVN's public API in a sense. It's, the, it's where you define an OVN, things like networks and ports and security policies and that sort of thing. So Neutron programs OVN. The next step of what happens in OVN is we have part of OVN is centralized. We have a service called OVN North D, which its job is to then populate a southbound database. The southbound database is used for an internal state of OVN. Um, it has a much more detailed representation of how the network should behave, which is uh, intended to be consumed by hypervisors, which then brings us to this next part. The southbound database is how we distribute the desired state of the entire uh, system to each hypervisor. And OVN controller on each hypervisor is what does all of the hypervisor-specific processing. So we've been very intentional about how we break up the stages of processing in OVN. So things that are centralized are done once in a central place. And everything that is specific to a hypervisor is then distributed out to the hypervisors. And that's for scale reasons. So I mentioned that OVN has a couple of databases. There's a northbound and southbound databases. And I want to mention a bit about um, about high availability. So part of what we've been doing more recently is not just building up features in OVN, but doing the kind of things that you have to have to move OVN into production. And part of that is high availability. So the database we're using is, is based on OVSDB. It's using OVSDB server. This is something that, that comes with OVS already. If you're using OVS, you're using OVSDB server. And so we made use of that. Um, so for, uh, it has some really nice properties um, that we've taken advantage of for OVN. Um, it was enhanced to add, to add a, like a backup, a mirror capability, so you can have a primary and a backup database. And we use Pacemaker to manage which node in your cluster is currently the primary and which one's the secondary and detect failures and ensure that failover happens uh, if necessary. Some other things that we've been looking at are either turning, uh, adding multi-master support to OBSDB. Ben's actually done quite a bit of work down that path uh, investigating that. We were also doing a lot of work investigating etcd version 3. Uh, some new versions that were added to etcd in version 3 that fulfill our requirements or appear to. So we're, um, there's a, also a strong chance that we'll migrate to that. And if we did, then we'd be providing a, uh, an upgrade path to get there. So we're looking at next steps. Address sets is another thing that came out of, so we implemented you know, OVN, we had features, and then we go off and test it at scale find bottlenecks, and this is one case where we found a bottleneck in our Neutron driver. So OVN ACLs are the feature that Neutron uses to implement security groups with OVN. It lets you specify, it gives OVN ACLs provide a very flexible match and action syntax for matching on traffic and then defi defining what you want to do with that, whether you want to accept it or drop it. And so this uh, sort of second line there gives an example of what an ACL might look like, sort of it, matching on source and destination and matching on some set of addresses for source and destination. This is a really common pattern in security groups. As we started testing scale and we had networks with, say, uh, thousands of ports in them, which is, uh, you know, can, hap can happen with OpenStack, those sets of addresses got quite large, and that was a... Uh, a, a, quite a performance problem in our Neutron plugin. So we had this thing called address sets where we've separated the defining a set of addresses and uh, defining the security policy. So the actual security policy stuff just refers to a set by the name of the set, and that uh, gave, gave us a, a huge performance boost back in our plugin. So that's the kind of work we've been doing lately uh, as we sort of move things to production is trying to hammer it as hard as we can, find the bottlenecks, and then resolve them and move on to the next one. This is the part of the talk that I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about because uh, um, debugging is a pain and uh, everybody uh, has to uh, figure out how to do it. So uh, I want to talk about a tool that we've added in uh, OVS 2.6 that allows you to, uh, uh, to debug uh, OVN. You can uh, answer questions like, uh, what's happening to this packet when it comes into the system? Uh, you can also do what if questions. Um, if I had a packet uh, that looked like this, uh, then what should be happening to it? 
And uh, OVN Trace can answer the, these kinds of questions. What, uh, what you feed into it is uh, a, a logical switch uh, that a packet comes in on, and then uh, a description of the packet. So for example, uh, at least the, uh, uh, the, the interesting fields uh, of, of the packet. Uh, for example, if, if you're interested in L2 forwarding, you'd at least want to give the uh, Ethernet source and destination. And, uh, if you wanted to know about L3 properties, then you'd want to give uh, the, the IP source and destination and, and, and so on. Um, and it, it only needs limited access to the system. We've, uh, we've pointed out the southbound database uh, there. It only needs to uh, be able to look at the southbound database in a read-only manner. It sort of slurps in a copy of it, and it uh, simulates that packet's uh, travel uh, through the system in, in the same way uh, uh, that, uh, um, that, that uh, OVN controller uh, w would do it. And it's actually uh, independent of the physical layout of your network. And in fact, it works even if your, uh, your hypervisors aren't really there. So you can even use it to play what if games uh, with, uh, you know, what if I set up a bunch of VMs and, and put uh, these switches in between them and so on. Uh, and furthermore, um, the, the output even uh, gives references back to bits of source code uh, in, in, in C uh, that, sa that say, oh, this was the code that, uh, uh, that determined uh, uh, that the packet should go this direction. It, it's a little bit like a, a backtrace of a, uh, of a C program. And uh, although it can give a lot of detail, uh, there, it turns out that in uh, many uh, OVN traces, uh, there's uh, these sort of trivial things uh, that would clutter the output and don't provide useful information, so, so it emits those. So I'm going to give a couple of examples, and I'm going to draw my examples uh, from this, uh, um, this, this uh, very simple logical network we see here at the bottom. I've got a, a single logical switch, LSW0, and it has two logical ports, uh, LP0, LP1, and uh, those two ports each have uh, a MAC address and an IP address assigned and uh, a security, uh, a port security is enabled. So uh, let, let's look at uh, one example with detailed output. So uh, what, uh, what the command here says is that we're tracing a packet that comes in, uh, in into a logical switch, LSW0. It, it's received from uh, logical port LP0, and it's got LP0's MAC address uh, as its source, and it's uh, being sent to broadcast. So uh, what, what we see here in the output there uh, is that, uh, um, uh, well, the, the first line there uh, says, indeed, it's ingressing on that switch in that port. And then uh, we, it passes through uh, a number of tables. Uh, the first table, table 0, uh, is, uh, is the one that does uh, uh, ingress port security at L2. And we can see that, indeed, uh, the, the, the packet passes through that since its Ethernet source address is what it should be. And then uh, the second line there says, oh, go on, to table, uh, go on to table one, because it passed the port security check. Then uh, the uh, output is skipping over uh, all those tables one through 12, because uh, none of them did anything interesting, and it would just clutter the output. Then finally, table 13 there, that uh, is doing an L2 output lookup, and that recognizes that this packet is directed to broadcast, and so it sets the output port to the flood port, and then it outputs it. And then we've got a second section here that, that shows that, uh, that what, uh, what that output does. So it, it's being sent to the, uh, the flood multicast group, and then sort of as sub-actions there, it's egressing on, on ports LP0, which, are, which is dropped because that's where it came in on, and then LP1, and it's actually output there. And, and so this is the very detailed output of what happens. And in more complicated situations, like if it went through a logical router, you'd, you'd get a lot more output. And sometimes that's really what you want, because uh, you're trying to figure out what happened or, or what really would happen. There's also a very minimal output format where you can say, just give me the summary the, of everything that actually happens to it. And so if we do the same example with the minimal output format, yeah, we find out that, in fact, the packet is just being output uh, to logical port LP1. So that's for uh, a, a simple, uh, simple case. Let's, let's look at the, uh, um, the minimal output for uh, a DHCP uh, request case. So uh, for this case, uh, OVN trace is being fed all the information you need to identify that the packet is, in fact, a DHCP uh, packet. 
Now, there isn't enough information there to say what kind of DHCP packet is. it is. So in the output, uh, the first thing it's telling us is that we're assuming for the case of the trace uh, that this is a DHCP request. And then you can see this uh, series of actions here. Uh, the first one there says, uh, take this DHCP request and replace it by a reply with all of that information in it. And uh, there could be more DHCP options. And if so, they would be listed with their values. Uh, and then the, the rest of the actions here, uh, what they're doing is they're transforming the request into a reply at the, uh, uh, at the L2 and L3 layers. And then finally, we're outputting it back to the, the place it came from. Uh, so uh, this sort of thing uh, can be awfully valuable in, in our experience um, at uh, multiple levels of a stack. All right, so we've talked a lot about where we are, and of course the project continues to move pretty fast, so we wanted to mention some things that are ongoing. So in the Neutron driver, there's a lot of work that happens in OVN itself. We've also got work that happens on the Neutron side. We're doing a lot of work around CI. Um, we've had a couple of variants of, of uh, Tempest jobs that run, you know, spin up OVN with DevStack and run the full Tempest test suite. We've had those for a while. We're now moving that to a multi-node setup where we're testing this across multiple test nodes. We've also done some amount of upgrade-based CI. The upgrade job that we had was actually a migration job where we sort of, it was the first proof of concept of where we can take an OpenStack deployment that was using the built-in uh, original OVS support and as a part of upgrading OpenStack, migrate to OVN. So that was the first job we did. We've got more work to do on that CI job, but now that we've actually made our first release of OVN, we need to add a second upgrade job that is from you know, one OpenStack and OVN release to the next release of each. Uh, so that's something we'll do here fairly soon. We've been doing work around SFC. There's a networking SFC project, a part of Neutron, defining a, a Neutron API for that. Uh, we, there's, there's work uh, all the way down into OVN itself to complete support for that API. And then generally keeping up with OVN is like a core part of what we do in the plugin is as features are added, we work on ensuring that they're exposed properly through OpenStack. All right, and so now I just wanted to, thank you, wanted to go over uh, some of the uh, things that we're planning on working on next. So I uh, mentioned a couple of these already. Uh, one is having support for native DNS so that uh, OpenStack internal names can be resolved. Uh, we want to, by default, or provide an easy mechanism so that people can enable encrypted tunnels, so all the traffic between two hypervisors would be encrypted through uh, most likely IPsec. We're looking at doing that. The nice thing about the central database that we have is it's a pretty easy way to do key distribution. Um, ben had mentioned the database clustering uh, that, uh, or maybe it was Russell, but anyway, we, that we uh, need to look at um, we're looking at alternatives to how we're doing um, the database right now um, to make it so that it's more scalable and um, has more um, ability to prevent uh, you know, single points of failure. And then the last two items are things that uh, I'm just going to go over now, which include BPF for OBS and service function chaining. So uh, BPF is uh, Berkeley Packet Filter. It's been around for a long time. It's part of uh, people usually interact with it on TCP dump when they specify the filters for, um, for what packets they want to look at. Uh, in the last couple of years, it's been extended uh, quite a bit in the Linux kernel. Uh, and so what BPF does is it allows, it provides a virtual machine essentially that can be executed in the kernel. So at runtime, you can insert new functionality into the kernel and it's guaranteed to be safe and that it will terminate. Uh, so in the past, you've had to write um, uh, a kernel module and then when you insert it, uh, there's some question about whether it would be supported. So for example, if you're Red Hat, you know, they don't really want people to take random kernel modules and insert them in because it can wreak all kind of havoc. Uh, but with BPF, you can write new functionality and insert that and you know that it's not gonna cause the system to crash or hang. Uh, and so we're, so the BPF has been, the extended BPF, but they're going back and now calling it just BPF, um, is been primarily worked on for the Linux kernel, uh, but there's also been a lot of work um, being done to um, look at porting it to other platforms, including Windows and DPDK. Uh, so one place where uh, BPF has been getting quite a bit of attention is in something called XDP. XDP is seen as an alternative to DPDK for Linux. So the way DPDK works is that uh, all packets go directly from the NIC, uh, bypass the kernel, and go straight to user space. Uh, the Linux kernel folks aren't a big fan of that, obviously. And so they're looking at an alternative where um, you can 
we're right at the driver level when the packet first comes into the kernel, you can associate BPF programs with that. So it bypasses a lot of the work that's done um, that is fairly expensive, where if you just need to make a very quick decision about the packet, you don't necessarily want to go through and, uh, and parse the packet and pass it through the different layers. Uh, so uh, XDP is an interesting application where BPF is being used. Uh, it's one hook point that we've been looking at for using for, uh, for OVS. And, uh, and just in case it wasn't clear, we're looking at um, rewriting the, the, uh, the data path uh, with BPF. And th there are a few reasons that this could be pretty interesting. Uh, the, the first is that currently if you want to uh, have a new function, you either have to use the, uh, in the kernel, you have to wait for the kernel to catch up. So we put changes um, upstream into the kernel and then it can take years before the Ubuntu or Red Hat uh, finally pick up those versions. Uh, so a lot of times what people do is they have to run the out of tree kernel version and, and then there's all these issues with backwards compatibility. Uh, once all of the, uh, the Linux distributions pick up BPF in the kernel, uh, then we don't have the same portability issue. Um, OVS, the user space, can generate the particular data path that's needed and that has all the functionality so that you're not tied to a particular version. You can just push that functionality down. And one thing, it's not completely clear that it will work, but I'm really hopeful it will, would be right now we have multiple data path implementations. So we have uh, one for Linux, uh, Linux kernel, one for DPDK, one for Hyper-V. And it'd be great if we could just have one BPF implementation of the data path and it works everywhere. And then you don't have this, this differences in functionality and times for, for, for releases. Um, another thing that is, uh, another couple things that are interesting about this potentially is uh, at runtime, we can support uh, new tunnel formats, uh, new network headers, uh, and we also might have the ability to push in oven-specific capabilities in the data path. So, for example, right now, if we want to reject a packet uh, because it, it violated a, uh, a policy rule, we would need to send that packet up to, to user space, and that can be fairly expensive, especially if these packets are coming in at a high rate. Uh, with BPF, we may be able to actually push a program down that says uh, reject a packet. And so now we can do everything just in the kernel. Uh, and I think there are other areas too that, uh, that this could be interesting as well for like ARP suppression, things like that. Uh, service function chaining, that's something I think has been a little bit of a hot topic at, uh, at OpenStack. Uh, there is uh, a proof of concept that's been worked on that works with Oven and the networking uh, SFC API. Uh, there's a talk on it tomorrow. Uh, if you're interested, I'd encourage you to go. Uh, none of us are giving it, but um, some other folks that are involved in OVN are, and so that's uh, tomorrow at 1.50. Uh, and so, you know, I, th I think this is an interesting area um, of, you know, how do we figure out, how do we put new functions into OVN that are not, um, that aren't necessarily built in, and so then you can look at, like, a commercial firewall might be able to, um, that could be integrated with OVN in a clean manner. Uh, a, few, uh, a few resources, so the OVS OVN repo are, are hosted at GitHub. Uh, all the development is happening on the OVS dev mailing list. It all happens out in the open, it's all public. Uh, we have uh, weekly IRC meetings where we discuss the, the project, uh, or discuss OVN in particular. Uh, the, the Kubernetes oven plugin is, is at that URL. Um, ben has been doing a, a podcast uh, on OVS called OVS Orbit. There's a link there if you're interested in listening to those podcasts. Uh, and we have a conference coming up in a couple of weeks uh, in uh, San Jose, California. So if you're in the area, I encourage you to, uh, to get tickets for that. Um, so 7th and 8th of, uh, of November. And the, the link is there if you're interested. And that's it. And so uh, we're open to uh, questions. Oh, yes. So the question was, what type of oven is this oh, release? Yeah, oh, is that sorry. for the, um, yeah, the oh, Q&A? Double, double mic. Yeah, uh, yeah so our, our, the joke, well, so we often call OVN oven. And the first release, we called the Easy Bake oven. And then I'm not sure what came after that. The microwave oven or yeah, toaster oven, the uh, microwave. I don't know. I'm feeling like we're at like conventional oven stage. Like it's, yeah. a, it's a legit oven. Okay. It's, you know, it's not like <laughs> that, the biggest that's one. That's not a bad name. I like legit oven. It's a legit <laughs> oven. <laughs> like you're, you're cooking some real food now. So. Okay. Uh, so where does the North D live? Is a single instance or? 
Yeah, Oven North D is a single instance, and you run it. Well, it kind of depends on on the environment. In the OpenStack case, you would call that a controller service. So, when, you know, we've got all the API services and other things. That would be something you'd co-locate there. As you start to scale out OpenStack deployments, you start to think about different types of controllers. You don't just throw all your control services on the same nodes. You might start splitting out your database on another node and those sorts of things. So in that case, I would envision the OVN databases and OVN North D being a collection of services that you put on a node together that you might split out separately. So the address sets, right? Does it depend on IP sets feature of kernel or? Uh, it was inspired by it, but it doesn't depend on it. It's, it's an OVN specific implementation of a similar concept. Okay, that, but you push everything into the kernel to keep track of those addresses, or is it in the user land or? It's in user space. Okay. Yeah. So it's not clear when it comes to OVS code. Um, control plane and data plane. It's clear that you're using some part of OVSDB, okay? But when it comes to code being actually involved of OVS itself, what, what you're actually using within the packet processing and the configuration part? Uh, it's, so the, uh, OVN uses OVS through the, the same interfaces as everyone else. So it, it accesses OVS through OpenFlow and, and OVSDB. Ah, so uh, do you mean that OVN is more like a front end? So in the back end, it will, for example, it will use OpenFlow rules and stuff like this? Yes. So, but, it, but one different model, it's slightly different model than OpenFlow typically is used. So there's that oven controller. Oven controller speaks OpenFlow and OVSDB. So you don't have a central controller, it's distributed. The, 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 that each, um, the OpenFlow connection is only local. Uh, uh, let me, I don't know who was first. We'll get you next though. Yeah, let me go. Oh, okay, or now. <laughs> he already had a question over here. Okay. So first of all, congratulations. I think it's a great work. And uh, just to confirm a couple of things, you didn't mention explicitly, but just I understand that with OVN, uh, we, will, we will see the removal of all the Linux breaches implementing security groups. Yes. Yep. That also removes the existing layer three agent. Yes. And uh, XTP, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more, it looks like it's zero copy processing from the NICs, zero, zero copy of the packets from the NICs? So, so the way that XTP works is, so an eBPF program is um, basically just, there, there's code that gets pushed down and then it gets jitted into you know, x86. And then you can hook it in at different places in the kernel. So there's, um, there's one location which would be TC. That's sort of probably the most obvious um, place to hook in. XTP is earlier, so it's basically right when the packet comes in at the driver, then the XTP hook gets called. So that's very fast. There are some downsides. Uh, so for example, uh, tunnel uh, decapsulation wouldn't have happened because that needs to go through the IP stack. So it's not entirely clear where we would hook in. I think we might have to hook into a couple of different locations. I think I think the short answer was yes, though. So, uh, <laughs> okay. okay. So, okay. So, at some point you will decide what you do, but the, the, the packet you will use get hook, copy from some oh. mechanism, so uh, packet and map or whatever to. Oh, yeah, so, so I think the question then was how does the packet then get to OVS vSwitchD if it needs processing? So currently the, uh, there is a well-defined interface uh, that uses Netlink to, to send packets between user space and kernel. Well, that's how, I'm just saying how it currently works. So I, the way that it would probably work for um, if we were to do eBPF, because if, once, we, once you use, have an eBPF program, you don't have to maintain backwards compatibility. So we actually change it from release to release. Um, the, there are a couple of different ways that BPF provides the ability to copy packets from user space to kernel. Uh, one of them is they have ring buffers that you can attach packets, and they're ex extremely fast. Uh, hello. Uh, OVN support uh, L2 gateway function. Uh, does the networking uh, OVN support uh, L2 gateway API in Neutron? So uh, we, OVN supports L2 gateways in two different modes, either like top of rack switch uh, based L2 gateways or software based gateways just using OVN controller on a Linux host. Um, our integration with OpenStack is a custom thing. It uses a port binding profile just because that was a trivial way to expose it to begin with. 
Um, we have not completed the L2 Gateway API support. It's sort of on the to-do list, but it's not done. I have a question about your DHCP implementation. So you were just looking at the sort of source address and the source MAC and destination MAC and the, the source port and destination port. But in, usually in DHCP, you also get a lot of other information, like you mm -hmm. can get the DNS server or something like that. Was that just simplification, or is that like the advanced functionality that you don't have yet? Or oh, it, we, we support arbitrary options. You can supply yeah. whatever you like, including DNS servers and so on. Yeah, the, the example okay. is a, sort of a simplified example in the OpenStack case. All the o options that OpenStack would typically provide to, to, um, to VMs are supported and fed down through OVN's DHCP support. I needed it to fit on the slide. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, based on all these pretty significant changes in current um, scale issues with current Neutron installations and L3 agents, have you done any scale testing? And if so, what are you looking at? Uh, we haven't uh, done, or we, we have done recent scale testing, but uh, that was done by IBM, and we don't have the results from it. Uh, we. Uh, E eBay reported on it uh, at the last OpenStack, and uh, their re results were that they were happy with it at 2,000 hypervisors, and then it was unsatisfactory at 3,000. But we're still working on improving that. That's just the yeah. current. And uh, uh, if, we'd like it to scale to 10,000. Yeah, the, the, phys the de deployments that have been done in physical environments are in the hundreds of nodes category, like three to 400 nodes. But we have a project called OVN Scale Test that lets us take a physical environment and simulate much larger scale. So a given physical host can simulate, well, as many hypervisors as you want. Um, uh, but you know, we might make it simulate 20 hypervisors or something and, and exercise the OVN control plane that way. And that's how we're getting the, the scale test results for things like 2,000 or 3,000 hypervisors as we simulate it with a smaller degree uh, physical deployment and, and stress it that way. But uh, that's actually another. Uh, repository and the open vSwitch GitHub, OVN scale test. That's the code that we use to do that simulated um, large scale testing. Uh, so the, uh, the question is similar uh, on the scale. So in my understanding for the southbound DB, right, all the hypervisor will access the same DB. So if you have 10,000 nodes, as you say, mm -hmm. do you, you know, envision a problem, you know, yeah. A big, uh, so surprisingly, that hasn't been the bottleneck. We actually expected it to be a bottleneck much sooner, and it hasn't been. But we know that like we need to we need to move to a clustered database solution, um, and and there's actually even some paths to um, having all of the like for example, one idea that we were discussing on the mailing list just last week was having all of the OVN controllers connecting to different. Um, a secondary databases that are for the backups, like having, having all the controllers um, sort of scattered across the backups and reading from those, and that would be another way to scale out even without the multi-master stuff. So we've got multiple paths to that, and we know that we need to do it. But in fact, surprisingly, it wasn't the bottleneck. It wasn't the first bottleneck we hit. The, the OPN Southbound database, it's very likely that we'll be changing it so that it has only a single writer, OVN Northy, and at that point, it becomes easier to uh, um, make it uh, uh, make it scale out uh, because you you can essentially uh, create these uh, th these sort of read only replicas uh, yeah. and uh, and replicate that and then push those out to large numbers of hypervisors. Thank you for your answer. I think we're out of time. Okay. So uh, back to the BPF uh, topic. Mm -hmm. uh, what parts of that is um, OVN and what parts of that is OBS? Well, currently it would be all, all be OVS, so it would be just and um, just to be clear, like the, the the OVS and OVN, we've we've really gone even though they're in the same repo, we've really gone to great pains not to cheat. So OVN is not doing anything; doesn't have any special hooks into OVS. We use the same APIs that are that are publicly available. Currently, all of the work would be just about accelerating the data path. The the things I was talking about with maybe putting OVN specific functionality that would be much later. So the 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 BPF is sort of right now currently separated. We're only focused. On, um, on doing a BPF implementation of the data path. I think that's all the time we have, but I, I know that uh, we can probably stick around and uh, answer questions individually uh, if you want to come up to the front. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.